Well, I decided, you know, I decided I was planking around a little bit, and I thought, you know what? I, I, I've never played the ukulele in, in worship, in service. So I thought this morning I would do that. Amen. Amen. So say thanks, Pastor. I, I yeah. Yeah. I'm going to do that. I, I, I wanted to get the thank you before I played, so that <laughs> <laughs> you may not want to thank me afterwards. All right, so uh, but uh, I, I just felt like uh, it was something I just give the Lord praise, give God glory and everything that we have in you. Amen? Amen. And, uh, and so uh, I'm going to ask that we're going to sing this song together, but I'm going to play it on the ukulele, all right? So, Greatest 
problem in your life that you're dealing with right now? And I said don't answer out loud because it might be your spouse. All right, so don't answer out loud. Okay. Or your children or whatever. But what's the greatest problem in your life that you're dealing with right now? And let me ask you another one. What's the greatest difficulty that you're dealing with right now? What's the biggest difficulty that you're struggling with? And it could be from any avenue of your life. It could be in your work, or it could be in a lack of work. It could be in your home, or in your marriage. It could be in your relationship with your kids. It could be a, a struggle with an addiction. It could be a financial problem. But again, what's the greatest struggle that you're dealing with right now? This morning, I want us to look at God's Word at one of the most memorable passages of Scripture in the Bible. I want us to see how we can deal with those kinds of giants in our own lives. And so as a result of dealing with giants, what better passage to look at than the story of David and Goliath. Amen? Amen. And what God teaches us about dealing with giants. Uh, look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 45 through 51. I have it printed on your outline there. Here's the focal passage we're looking at today. Here's what it says. It says, Then David said to Goliath, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Pause there for just a moment. Would you circle that phrase, if you've got a pen or pencil, circle the phrase where it says, I come to you in the name of the Lord, uh, uh, in the name of the Lord of hosts. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Because, folks, that's a pretty powerful weapon. The name of Jesus. Amen? Amen. That's a pretty powerful weapon. I mean, I love this because David said, I've come to fight with a name. I I've come to do battle with a name. And, folks, I've got to tell you, we need to get a clue here. We need to understand that our Bible... And, and, and our battle, rather, not our battle, but our battle is not against flesh and blood, but our battle is against principalities of darkness. Yeah. Our battle is against spiritual forces of wickedness. And the only way you can win that kind of a war is with a name that's really above all other names, and that's the name of Jesus. Amen? Yeah. That's the only way you can win. So, well, in this kind of battle, man-made weapons aren't going to cut it. And that's what we read just in that opening, opening paragraph there. Man-made man -made weapons just aren't going to cut it in this kind of a battle. All right, let's read on. It says, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands, and I will strike you down, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Then it happened when the Philistine rose and came and drew near to meet David, that David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and he took from it a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead so that he fell on his face to the ground. Then and thus David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead. When they saw it, they fled. When they saw that he was dead, what did the Philistines do? Uh, when, when all the other demons saw that Satan was defeated, what did they do? See, right? When God is at the center of things, when God takes center stage, when God moves in and God takes control of the situation, demons, all the forces of hell, have only one recourse, and that is to what? Flee to get away as fast as they can, as far away as they can. I just love this story. In fact, before we go any further, let me define for you what a giant really is today. What, 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 what does a giant look like today? I wrote this on your outline there. But what is a giant today? Let me just try to define it this way. First of all, a giant is anything that defies your faith. If there's anything in your life that defies your faith, that's a giant. See, and anything, it, it's anything really that comes in front of you that taunts you and challenges you, just like Goliath did to David or attempts to defy your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a giant. Tries to rob you of that. That's a giant. It defies your faith. Secondly, a giant is anything that deepens your fears. If there's anything that deepens your fears, that's a giant that you're going to have to deal with. If your fear just continues to grow, it's because this giant is getting bigger right before your very eyes. And so it's anything that deepens your fears. It's anything that causes you to be more afraid. Anything that causes inner fear or that feeling of dread. Number three, a giant is anything that disrupts your focus. It disrupts your focus. It causes you, it's anything that causes you to take your eyes off of Jesus for a moment. Or it causes you to take your eyes off of your priority. 
or your purpose that God has called you to. Anything that disrupts your focus. So a giant is anything that, that defies your faith, deepens your fears, disrupts your focus. Number four, a giant is anything that deflates your feelings. It's anything that deflates your feelings. In other words, it causes you, anything that, that comes against you that causes you to want to wallow in self-pity or, or to wallow in a sense of hopelessness. That, that's a giant that you're going to have to deal with. And number five, a giant is anything that depresses your fortitude. It's anything that depresses your fortitude. If it absolutely weakens your strength or weakens your resolve in Christ or your service to Christ, that's a giant. You have to deal with it. You can't, look, you can't ignore giants, amen? Because sooner or later, they're going to, sooner or later, they're going to take you on whether you like it or not. I mean, sooner or later, you have to deal with it. These, these are the things that are symptomatic of giants in our lives today, though. They attack our strength, and they attack our feelings, and our fears, and our focus, and even our faith. These are the scriptural giants uh, and spiritual giants that are in our lives that come against us. Scripturally, they are the giants that we have to deal with. So the question is, how do you deal with these kinds of giants? How do you do battle with these kinds of giants? Well, let me, let me, let me be quick to point out that conquering a giant like that may be as simple, really, as just learning to stand. Some giants, in order to, to defeat it, really all you have to do is stand there. But stand there in the name of Jesus Christ. You, you take your stand. You don't chicken out. You don't run away. You, you, you take your stand. And, and, and sometimes in just standing, you, what you do is you persevere. And you just go through the adversity. And you do it without being weakened in your faith. In fact, your faith you find is even being increased. The, the more you stand, the deeper you stand, the stronger you stand, the more your faith gets increased. In other words, you may be able to defeat some kinds of giants in your life. You know, some kind of giants require spiritual weapons, the, the weapons that we have spiritually. But some of them, you just simply have to persevere. But either way, the point is, you can defeat your giants. Amen? Yeah. You can't do that. Now, young David, he went to a stream... And he picked out five smooth stones in which to slay his giant with. He picked out five. He reached into the riverbank. He reached into the water down there. He found five smooth stones. And he knew what he was looking for. He knew what kind of stones he needed. Because he had practiced with that slingshot many, 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 many times. And so he knew what kind of stone it would take to do the job. He knew what kind of stone it would take to be accurate. What kind of stone it would take to, 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 to sling the distance that would be required and the speed that would be required to take this giant down. So he was very particular about the stones that he chose, but he chose five. And so what I, I don't care what your giant is, what I want to do today is help you to find five of these stones as well so that you can rock your giant as well. And I believe with all my heart that the stones that I'm going to give you right now will work. They will work if you employ them. So we're just going to draw these stones, I think, right out of the brook of scriptures today. We're going to go down to the edge of the brook of scripture, and we're going to draw these stones out. And uh, they're coming right out of 1 Samuel chapter 17. I wrote this on your outline. There are stones needed to rock your giants. Here's the first one, number one. The first stone that you've got to get in your arsenal against your giant is what I call examine your cause. This is the stone of cause. You need to examine your cause. Um, see, you've got you to have the stone of cause or the stone of purpose in your life if you're going to win the battle. See, in 1 Samuel 17, 29, after listening to his ungod, this ungodly Philistine giant, after listening to this pagan taunting the armies of God, after hearing him ridicule the armies of God and dragging the name of Jehovah God through the mud, David said, David said, look, I'll fight this Philistine. I'll go up against him. I'll do it. And yet David's older brother, Iliad, he came to David and he got all upset with him. He said, what are you doing here, you little squirt? Go home with the sheep, boy. You don't need to be around here. But look at David's response to him. 1 Samuel 17, 29, the next verse on your outline. David simply said, is there not a what? Uh, is there not a cause? He's saying, hey, brother of mine, isn't there something worth fighting for here? Isn't there something worth standing up and fighting for? Isn't there a purpose worthy of engaging this giant for? Isn't there a cause here that's worth fighting for? On your study guide, I made an acrostic on purpose. And yes, I made it on purpose, but I made it about the word purpose as well. 
And, uh, and, and what I want to do is take every letter of the word purpose, and I, I want us to see what it means. I, I think it will help us in relating to and understanding the purpose of a cause and having a purpose. But what I really want you to focus on is the three little words that follow each of the words I'm going to give to you, and those are the words more than ordinary. Say that with me. More, more than, than ordinary. ordinary. More than ordinary. More than what? Ordinary. ordinary. Because you see, when you have a cause in life, when you have a specific purpose in life, that purpose, that cause, is going to take you beyond the plane of average. And it will take you to the realm of going that second mile and of doing more than ordinary. If you've got a cause, if you've got a purpose, you will do more than is expected of you. You'll do more than is just simply required of you. You will do more than just what everybody else is doing. You will do more than ordinary. When you have a cause, when you have a purpose. So I submit to you that the, when you have a purpose or a cause worth fighting for, first of all, number one, you will pray more than ordinary. Just write that in there. You will pray more than ordinary if you've got a cause and if you've got a purpose. It will drive you to your knees more than ordinary. Everybody tends to pray when we get into trouble or when we're back into a corner. But those who live every day of their lives with a purpose and a cause, they live with this dynamic drive that, that pushes everything that they do, including prayer. And so prayer is not just an emergency switch to them. Prayer is not just something that they just run to when they're in desperate measures. But prayer is something that these folks who have this sense of purpose and cause, they do every single day. And they pray because of that cause. They pray because of that purpose. When you have a cause, you'll pray more than ordinary. Secondly, when you have a purpose or a cause, you will unite more than ordinary. You will unite more than ordinary. You're going to be in unity with other believers. You're going to be in unity and in harmony with your church. You're going to want to be in unity with God's word. You're going to be one in, 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 in unity with the leadership of the church and, and unity with the leadership of the Holy Spirit. When you have a purpose, unity in your life will become more important than, than ever before because of that cause. And you'll, be, you'll have more unity than is ordinary. Number three, when you have a purpose, you will risk more than ordinary. You will risk more than ordinary. If you don't have a cause worth fighting for, then you're not going to have any sense of risk. If there's not something worth standing for, if there's not something worth fighting for, if there's not a cause you're going after, then what have you got to risk? Amen? Yeah. And you won't risk anything. Uh, in fact, what, what will happen is you'll end up saying, hey, let's just play it safe, man. Let's just, let's just hold on to what we've got. Let's not risk anything. But if you have a purpose or a cause that is greater than your fear of losing, you will risk more than ordinary. Number four, letter P stands for plan. You will plan more than ordinary. When you have a cause, when you have a purpose, you will plan more than ordinary. If you've got a purpose or a cause, you're going to prepare more. You're going to plan more. You'll be more diligent to use all that's at your disposal when you have a cause. Letter O stands for observe. Stands for observe. When you've got a cause worth fighting for, you will observe more than ordinary. If you're going to be conscious of everything that's going on around you, you're going to be more sensitive to it. You're going to observe more than ordinary. Those who live with the mentality and the frame of mind that we are living in the last days, they tend to observe everything that's going on a lot more closely than those who don't. Amen? Amen. Those who don't live with a sense of purpose in, in, in looking for the return of Jesus Christ, they just miss it. They don't see it at all because they aren't looking. There isn't a cause that's driving their observation. When you have a purpose, when you have a cause, and it's deep in your soul, deep in your heart, you'll observe what's happening around you a whole lot more fully. Then the letter S stands for sacrifice. You will definitely sacrifice more than ordinary. You will sacrifice more. Listen, if you don't have a cause or a purpose, you're not going to be willing to pay the price. You know, many of our veterans, they, they had a cause to fight for. You know what that cause was? It was called freedom. It was called freedom, and they fought for it, and many of them paid the ultimate price. They sacrificed their very lives, but they did that because when you have a cause to fight for, you will sacrifice more than ordinary. And then finally, letter E, and I think this is especially true, if you have a cause worth fighting for, you will expect more than ordinary. You will expect more than ordinary. If you're living with a purpose, if you go against whatever giant you're having to face now, the giant that you just thought about, and I ask you that question, what's your giant? 
what's disturbing you, what's troubling you, what's your giant today? As you go against that giant, if you go against that giant with a cause, with a holy cause, with a godly cause, you can expect more than ordinary. You can expect more than your defeat. But you can expect the defeat of your giant. Amen? Amen. You can expect that. David said, is there not a cause here? Isn't there something worth fighting for? There was a, there was a doctor who did a survey of folks who were over 100 years of age, and, and he surveyed literally hundreds of people who had made it to 100 looking for the secret of their longevity. He was trying to discern what was the common thread among all these folks that was true of all of them that gave them this, this seemingly longer life. And he was expecting to find things like, well, maybe it was their diet, or maybe it was their exercise habits, or maybe it was the lack of things that they did, or, or some things that they did more than others, or whatever. But, but you know what the one common denominator was among all of those who were 100 years of age or greater that he interviewed? The one common denominator that all of them had, it was this, that they all, every single one of them, had a bright outlook on their future. Every one of them had a bright outlook on their future. I mean, every one of them, every day of their lives, they woke up every morning looking forward to their day. They woke up looking forward to their day, and they were looking forward to their tomorrow. They, they, they woke up that way. They were looking forward to life. They were looking forward to their future. They had a sense of purpose, not only for today, but for tomorrow as well. Damn. They still had, you know what they had? They had an attitude of adventure. They never lost that, even at 100 years. And, and listen, you, you, I've sat down and I've talked to some folks that are 100 years old. And, and I tell you, that's true. They still have this sense of adventure. And they laugh. And they're enjoying life. They love life. Life is an adventure for them. Listen, have you ever heard of someone who was in the hospital and they're sick? And the doctor comes in and he says to the family, he says, you know, if he wants to, he'll live. If he's got the will to, he'll live. You ever heard that? In other words, we've done all we can do. Now it's up to him if he's got the will to do it. If he's got the desire to do it. See, if you lose your purpose for living, you're going to find that dying becomes a very easy thing to do. You've got to have a purpose in life. Having a purpose and a cause is very important in life. In fact, look at the next key thought on your outline there. The only difference between the ordinary and the extraordinary is a purpose. That's the only difference between just the ordinary and the extraordinary is a purpose. The ordinary dies at 60 to 75 years of old of age. The older ones, that we would call them extraordinary in their lifespan. Why? Because they have a purpose. They have a cause. We're living. Listen, whatever giant you're facing today, you need to first of all establish this one stone. You need to get this thing in your bag right now. You've got to get it in and you need to examine your cause. Make sure that you have a cause and a purpose worth fighting for and that's worth living for. Now, I don't know about you, but the cause in my life that's worth fighting for and the cause in my life that's worth living for and yes, even to die for is my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So you, you examine the cause. What is it that you're really living for? What's the real purpose, the bottom line purpose of your life? Number two. The second stone that you need in your arsenal against your giant is what I call evaluate your cost. It's the stone of cost. Evaluate your cost. Evaluate your cost. I mean, if you're going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a giant in your life, you're going to have to, and if you're going to go against these giants that want to annihilate your faith and annihilate your focus and all of that, then know this, it's going to cost you something to go against them. So you've got to evaluate your cost. Look at what Jesus said in, in Luke 14, 28. Jesus said, for which of you, when he wants to build a tower, does not first sit down and calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it? And then later on in that same passage, Jesus then says, a king doesn't go to war unless he's evaluated the strength of his army against the strength of the army that he's going up against. And so he says, there's a cost that needs to be counted. You need to evaluate the cost. So there's a certain amount of preparation needed in doing battle with giants. Now David, David paid the price. David paid the price to defeat the giant. And he did it in two particular areas. The cost was in two particular areas, and I find these to be very common among all of us as well. So let me just point them out to you. Number one, first of all, David paid the price of criticism. Write that in there. David paid the price of criticism. David was severely criticized. He was severely criticized. Because remember, Jesse, who was David's father, had sent David, who was, by the way, the youngest of eight brothers. Jesse sent David away from the task of shepherding the sheep to the battle lines for the purpose of taking food to his brothers. He had a purpose, 
His greatest purpose was the glory of God, amen? amen. But he still had a purpose, a sub-purpose beneath that purpose. And uh, that was to take food to his brother. Now, you've got to understand that when David got there, he found a very depressed and very discouraged army. I mean, for 40 days and nights, they had heard this behemoth of a man, this big old ape yelling things at him. And, and, and he was yelling, and he's saying, send me one of your warriors out. Send me one of your warriors out and fight with me. I, I, I'll take anyone, anybody who wants to come. And, and the one who wins the one-on-one -on -one battle with me, they, they win the war. And the losing army is going to serve the winning army. So bring them out. Come on, come on, you cowards. Bring one out. Bring one person out. And for 40 days and nights, the army of Israel heard that same challenge and the taunting and the ridicule of this man over and over and over again. And not one soldier in the entire army of Israel would volunteer to be the one to go and fight. Not one person would say, I'll take the risk. Not one person would say, I'll go fight this guy. Not one person did that. And now all of a sudden, here comes this kid, this teenager. And David said, I'll fight Goliath. I'll be the one to meet this challenge. I'll be the one to do it. By the way, I was thinking about this. Do you think that God maybe had a hand in not driving one other person to go out there? You know, a lot of times we think, well, it's because of the cowardice of Israel that they didn't go. And maybe that was partially true. But I think to some degree, sometimes God just holds things back, just waiting for that one right person. Just waiting for that one right moment. That one that one right thing to occur. He was waiting for Jesse to say David, your brothers are hungry. Go feed them. Because God knew David would show up and David would go I'm here. I'll take him on. Because God had already chosen his new king. Amen? Amen. Long before David knew it, long before anybody else knew it. God had already chosen his king. Forty days and nights, Israel. Listen to this. David comes along and says, I'll fight this guy. And now all of a sudden, this kid's teenager says, I'll take him on. Listen, the very first thing that happens to someone who says, I'll take on my giant. I'm going to take on this obstacle. I'm going to take on this challenge. The very first thing that happens is that someone is going to criticize you for it. I can promise you that's the very first thing that's going to happen. Now, for David, it was his older brother who brought the criticism. Look at it, 1 Samuel 17, 28. Now, Eliab, his older, oldest brother, uh, heard what uh, he had spoken to the men, and Eliab's anger burned against David. We call this displaced, displaced anger, by the way. It's called displaced, displaced anger. And it burned against David, and he said, Why have you come down here, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? Now, have you noticed that when somebody criticizes you, that they have a tendency to exaggerate things in an effort to make them look worse than they really are. Yeah. People who are critical of something exaggerate things. I mean, David had thousands of sheep that he was caring for, but because Gilead's mad at him, he tries to make David look insignificant by saying, those few sheep, those few sheep there, just those little sheep. Listen, when people are being critical, they'll take whatever extreme best serves their criticism. He says, I know your insolence and your wickedness, the wickedness of your heart, for you have come down in order to, to see the battle. In, in other words, he's saying, look, you just come down so that you can you came down so that you can get out a little bit on the glory side. You just, you just want to see the battle. You just want to see some sparks fly. David, you're too young. There's a kid. You don't need to be here. Go home, squirt. That's what he was saying to him. Now listen, folks, when you begin to get criticized for the way you choose to deal with the giants in your life. When you start getting criticized by just remember that that's part of the price tag that you're going to have to pay. Criticism will come your way. If you decide today, oh, there's this giant that's in my life, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to fight this giant. I promise you there's going to be somebody who comes along and begins to criticize you for it, criticize how you're doing it, why you're doing it, what. They're going to bring criticism. Don't let that, don't let that stop you. Don't let that be what keeps you from going after and slaying that giant. No one is going to applaud you before you conquer your giant, but they will criticize you for it. I mean, after you've conquered your giant, then people are going to say, oh, way to go, we knew you could do it all along. <laughs> yeah, right. But they'll never say that before you slay the giant. Amen? They usually just criticize you for it. Listen, could it be that one of the reasons that we don't step out and defeat the giants in our lives is because we're waiting for the cheers and affirmations of other people first? It's not going to happen. See, if you're going to deal with the giants in your life, you've got, to, you've got to do it whether the crowd cheers or not, whether the crowd votes for it or not. You're going to have to pay the price of criticism. Can't you just see little David? I mean, there's, there's thousands of uh, 
men on this side of, of um, one hill, thousands of opposing army on this hill, and there's Goliath down here in the valley just calling out, and then here walks out from the, the, the just this out of the line, this one little kid comes walking out, down the valley. Listen, do you think that the army of Israel was cheering for David? No, they were sitting there going, oh, okay, this is it, we're done for now. Oh, no, this is it. They, they, they weren't cheering him. But I think we're going to find in just a moment that when, after he finished, after he beat the, the, the Goliath, after he defeated his giant, there were a lot of cheers. In fact, something happened that was rather profound at that moment. But there's not going to be a lot of cheers when you face your giant. Uh, but there will be criticism. That's the price that you have to pay. Secondly, number two, the second price that David had to pay was this David paid the price of loneliness. He did pay the price of loneliness. Now, like we pointed out in last week's message, I know that we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, and so He is always with us no matter what. So we're never really all of them. Amen? Amen. We're never really all of them. However, when it comes to the flesh, when it comes to being a physical being, when you, when you deal with the giants in your life, most of the time, you're going to have to be dealing with it all alone. Most of the time, you're going to have to deal with that giant all alone. You're going to have to have such fortitude and such stature and such purpose and again, it's that purpose in your life that gives you the conviction to stand up against it. But more than likely, when you stand up, you're probably going to be all alone in doing so. I mean, look at what David said in, in, in 1 Samuel 17, 32. It says, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. You guys, don't worry about it. I'm going. I'll be the one. Guys, you don't have to worry about it. I'm not asking anybody else to go with me. I'm not calling for volunteers. I'm, I'm not taking the vote on this thing. You don't have to worry about voting. I'm just going to go do this thing. I'm going to do it all alone. Because it's what God has laid on my heart to do. Amen? Amen. See, David was willing to face this giant, even if it meant he had to do it all alone. You've got some giants in your life that I know you would love to have help with. I know there's some giants that you're facing that you would love to have somebody come along and tell you what to do. You'd love to have somebody come alongside of you and say, here's how you do it, man. You get out there and you do this and this and this and this, and you're going to win. But it ain't going to happen that way. Very little in life really happens that way. Most of the time, it's just you out there doing what you know you need to be doing. And just doing it the best you can in the power of God. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so you are all alone in that sense. But that's why... It's when you have a cause, when you have a purpose that's worth fighting for, you're willing to take that risk. You're willing to step out and do it, even if it's all wrong. David Livingston was a great missionary to Africa, and he accomplished so very much all by himself. Just served as that missionary all by himself. Well, there were some church folks back in the States who heard that he was having to serve all alone there in Africa, and so they sent a message to David Livingston that said this. Here's what the message said. It said, we've got people who want to come and assist you, David. Please advise us of the easiest road access to where you are. Livingston sent back a message, and he said, if the people you're sending me have to have the easy road access, I don't want them. Only send people who are willing to come without a road. <laughs> See, sometimes, folks, there's nothing but wilderness. Sometimes there's nothing but jungle ahead of us. Sometimes there's nothing but obstacles in front of us. But when you deal with the giants in your life, if you're going to evaluate the cost, then you better understand that more times than not, you're going to have to stand alone in this thing. Because other people are not going to want to pay the same price as you. And frankly, why should you? Amen? Now I know that there are some Christians, God bless them, who will come along and they'll be willing to do that just because they believe that much in helping brothers and sisters. Christ. I know that. But most of the time, if it's your giant, they can't really do anything to defeat your giant anyway. Amen? Yeah. It's only going to be you. You have to do that. And by the way, if it's just you and Jesus out there in the battlefield, you can be assured of this. It's all you really need anyway. Amen? Amen. In fact, look at this next thought in your outline there. I just wrote it in there. Every person who has never killed a giant will tell you that it's impossible. Yeah. Amen? Anybody who's never killed a giant will tell you it's impossible. They'll tell you, you can't do this. You can't do this thing. You can't go there. You can't do this. You can't move this way. You can't do this. You can't. They've never killed a giant. How would they know? Amen? That's right. 
By the way, <laughs> remember this. They may think it's impossible, but with God, all things are what? Possible. All things are possible. So examine your cause. Evaluate the cost. Number three on your outline there. The third stone that you need is this. Establish your course. Now establish your course. That's the third stone. Get in there. Establish the, 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 have the stone of course. Yeah. You just go ahead and establish the fact that this is what I'm going to do. This is what I believe, but I believe it to the point now of doing something about it. I'm not just going to think about it anymore. I'm not just going to contemplate it anymore. I'm going to do something about this thing. I I'm going to be a doer of the word, not a doer only. I'm going to establish my course, and I'm going to stick with it now. Now, folks, understand this, that, that if you ever declare what it is that you're going to do. I mean, David said, I'm going to fight Goliath. When David said that, he established his course. Once he spoke it, his course was established. Amen? You can think about things. You can contemplate things. You can imagine things. But once you speak something, your course is established. Once it flows from your mouth into the atmosphere, your course is established. It's established. That's why the Bible cautions us so, that's one of the reasons anyway, about the use of our tongue and about what we say and what we don't say. Because what we speak establishes our course. Because when we speak it, not only do other people hear what we've determined in our heart and in our mind, but so does Satan. So does the devil, amen? And once he hears what you intend to do, that's what motivates him then to move against you. And he'll bring that giant against you. But we establish our course when we speak it. If you've ever set your course, if you've ever spoken something, now and you said, I intend to do this. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. I can tell you three things that are going to happen if you ever make public your decision to face this giant in your life. Three things are going to happen. They're on your outline there. Number one, once you establish your course, it will be tested by somebody. It will be tested. That course will be tested by somebody. Somebody's going to put your commitment now to the test. According to verse 31 of this passage, the minute David established his course, King Saul, the king of Israel, he sent for David. Once David said, I'll do it, see, King Saul could have cared less about David until David said this. Once David said this, guess what? He got an audience with the king. In the moment that you establish your course, somebody's going to test your commitment to your word. I mean, if you were to say, I'm going to win 15 people to Jesus Christ this year, my giant is the giant of inability to win people to Christ, and you make that statement, I can promise you that within a week, somebody's going to say, how many of you won to Jesus so far? How many people have you won to Christ so far? See, if you establish your course, somebody's going to test it. And that's not a bad thing, because God will use other people in our lives to hold us accountable to our word. Amen? Amen. He'll hold us accountable by other people. Secondly, if you establish your course, somebody will doubt it. Somebody will test it, but somebody will also doubt it. They will doubt your word. And you'll either verify the doubt, or you'll overcome the doubt. But somebody will doubt it. Saul said to David, verse 33, he said... You're not able to go against the Philistine and fight him. You're only a boy, and he's been a warrior since his youth. He's saying, David, I know you're hard about this. It sounds like you really want, but David, look, man, you're just a little kid. It, it ain't going to happen. Saul has serious doubts about David's commitment, and there will be people who have doubts about yours as well. If you've got this giant, it could be family, it could be friends, it could be other church members. But they're going to bring some testing and they're going to bring some doubts to you. Thirdly, not only will people test you and doubt you when you've established your course, but number three, inevitably, somebody will tell you how to do it their way. <laughs> somebody will tell you how to do it their way. I mean, have you ever noticed that when you're dealing with a problem in your life and you tell others how you're going to deal with it, that there's always folks who are going to say, well, let me tell you what I would do. Let, 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 let me tell you, this is how I would do it if I were you. If, if I were you, I would do it this way. I mean, Saul said, look, David, look, you set your course, David. I heard your words. You set your course. That's great. You said what you're going to do, but I don't think you're going to be able to do it. I kind of doubt that. But if you're dead set on trying this thing, then let me tell you how to do it right. 
Let, let me tell you how to do this thing so that you at least have a chance. Here's what you do. Put on my armor. Use my equipment. Use my shield. Use my spear, David. See, Saul was quick to tell David how to deal with his problem, and yet Saul wasn't willing to be one stinking thing about it himself. Amen. See, there, there will always be people who are going to want to tell you how to win your battles, but they themselves don't want to be one stinking thing to help. I mean, I, I've always got people telling me how I should pastor. I've, I've had that my entire pastoral career. People always tell me how I should pastor. I, and not, not just from congregation members. Not from, and not, I mean, I, I've had it from lost people. I've had unsaved people try to tell me how I should pastor, what pastors should and shouldn't do. Unsaved people try to tell pastors what to do. Is that stupid? Yeah. I say that's so insane. But there's a lot of pastors who get swayed by it. They get, they, they get turned on it. But not only pastors trying to tell me how to pastor, I've had other pastors tell me how to, uh, or, uh, how to pastor. I've had other pastors tell me. But they themselves don't do one thing in regards to my ministry. They don't do one thing in the help of my ministry. They always see what needs to be done, but they don't do anything about it themselves. So how do you deal with that? How do you deal with people like that? Well, look at 1 Samuel 7, 37. By the way, David, David uh, did. He did try on Saul's armor. But you know what David did? I mean, the, the uniform was way too big for David to begin with. I mean, it would, it would be like putting, you know, uh, you know, my shirt, you know, on, 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 uh, on Matthew there. I mean, it just wouldn't fit, you know. It was just great down to the floor. That's the way the uniform was. So, okay. so David just pulled it off and he said, he said, I've not tested this stuff. This just isn't me. These aren't my gifts. I'm sorry, King, but I just got to do what God made me to do best. I've got to fight this battle my way. I've got to fight this battle using the gifts that God has given me. And look at what David said in 1 Samuel 17, 37. He said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go and may the Lord be with you. <laughs> I like it. See, David not only set his course, but he spoke in the fact that he said, he said, Look, God's given me stuff back here. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to go for it. And so what, what's Saul going to do except say, God be with you? Go in God's power. How do you establish your course? Now, what are some ways you, uh, to really help you st stay true to that course? How do you do that? Well, let, let me encourage you this way. You establish your course. Now, listen, this is what David did. You establish your course according to the past victories in your own life. That's how you establish the course. Uh, you establish a course, you chart a course, but you base it on your past successes and victories in your life. That's exactly what David did. Uh, see, David said, I'm going to fight that big mouth Philistine but let me give you a little bit of background, O King. See, I'm already 2-0. and oh. I've already had two victories, two big ones. I mean, I've taken a bear out with my own two hands. I, I, I just took him out. I, 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 took, I took on a lion head to head, took him out too. So listen, the same God who delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion is the same God's going to deliver me from the paw of the Philistine. See, David was charting his course based on his past successes. Now listen, that's why the little things in your life are so important. Now listen, the little things in your life are so important. They're, they're important because these little things become successes or failure in your life. When you might, say, you might say, well, come on, Pastor, now wait a minute. But look, it's just a little cussing. I only cuss a little bit. It, it's just a word I use when I get angry. It's just a word that comes out when I get mad. It's, it's just a little thing. Well, if it's such a little thing, then conquer that giant right now. Amen. If it really is such a little thing, then do away with it. Because if you don't conquer the little giants in your life right now, then you're not going to be able to conquer the bigger ones later on. Well, Pastor, it's just a little habit. I mean, I only drink socially. I only drink when I get home or when I'm alone. It's really no big deal in my life. Well, if it's not really a big deal, then give it up right now. Amen. Why do it at all if it's no big deal? Conquer that giant right now. Deal with that area of the conviction of the Holy Spirit that he's put on your heart. Do it right now if it's not that big a deal. If it is a, if it is a big deal, it's a giant. You just haven't recognized it yet. Amen? Yeah. Maybe the Holy Spirit's been convicting you about drugs. Or maybe about... Maybe about an explosive anger. Maybe it's about your attitude. Or maybe it's about that giant of jealousy in your life. Or maybe it's about that pornography issue or, or that lack of communication in your marriage. 
The point is, many times we try to dismiss these things as no big deal. It's just a little thing. But I'm telling you that those things are a big deal. And God is telling you today that He wants you to conquer those little giants in your life. He wants you to overcome them. See, the problem is, if you aren't willing to tackle the little areas, if you, if you aren't having at least some progress in the little areas of your life, then you're never going to be willing to take on the really big giants that are going to confront you later on. You won't be willing to do it. See, when you start having victories, though, over those seemingly small areas of your life, that's when you begin building a history of God's victories in your life. And then when you're facing the big giants, the big challenges in your life, you can look back like David did and you can say, well, you know what? God helped me defeat that adversary and God helped me defeat that problem and God helped me to defeat that obstacle. And if he can do all of that in my life, surely he can help me defeat this giant as well. Amen. And you chart your course then based upon past victory. You see that giant, you go, no problem. He did it here, he did it here, he did it here, he did it here. I know he can do it here. That's right. And you chart your course based on that. So you just need to establish your course and then stick to it based on past victory. Here's number four. Number four. The fourth stone that I want to give you this morning is this. Once you've charted your course, then you exercise your commitment. That's the fourth. It's the stone of commitment. You exercise your commitment. I mean, you've established your course, you set the way you're going to go, now start walking within it. Just start walking within it. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 45. David said, But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you taunted. See, David is making his commitment a reality. But what's interesting is that back in verse 44, now listen, Goliath had been taunting David, and now both of them are moving toward their commitment. See, Goliath didn't back down just simply because David made a commitment. Just because David charted his course, just because David said, I'm going to do this, just because David didn't. The devil didn't back down. The devil set out on his course. He set out on his commitment. Both of them are moving toward it. And the commitment from Goliath is this. Goliath said, I'm going to feed your flesh to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. That's his commitment. Now, folks, listen, I'm going to tell you, that's positive thinking. Amen? And that's the way Goliath saw things. And may I say that that's the way the devil sees things as well. The devil is one of the most positive thinkers there is in the world. Yeah. He thinks positively all the time. I mean, I think the devil still thinks he can win in the end. I still think he believes that. I mean, Satan is a positive thinker, at least in regards to his commitment. I mean, the Bible says that Satan has come to kill and to steal and to destroy. That's his commitment toward you and I. Amen? Yeah. Come on, amen? That's his commitment. He's come to steal from you. He's come to kill you. He's come to destroy you any way he can. That's his commitment to you. But David took it a step further because David was doing more than just thinking positively. David was also positively faithing it. Yes. He was positively faithing it. Because in verse 46 of the same chapter, David said, The Lord will give you into my hands. I will strike you down. And not only will I give your body to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field, he said, but I'm going to do the same thing to the entire Philistine army. Amen. <laughs> wow. Folks, David wasn't just talking about Goliath going down. He's talking about bringing down the whole human army. Yes. He said, it's not just you, Goliath, I'm going to take down. All those behind you, they're going as well. Amen. They're gone as well. Folks, David wasn't just talking about the life but everybody. You know, in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul gives us an expression of faith that really is what I call positive faith. I, I think this is positive faith. Look, Philippians 4.13, Paul said, I can do all things through Christ, through Christ who strengthens me. Say that with me. Let's say it together. I'm ready. Here we go. I can, I can do, do all, all things through Christ who strengthens me. Now, that's really beyond positive thinking. Let me, let me show you how. Now, look, it's on your outline there. The phrase, I can, this is positive thinking. If, if you just stop there, Paul just said, I can, that's positive thinking. If you just stop there, that's what it would be, positive thinking. I can. I can. That's positive thinking. I, I can is the expression that all positive thinkers use, whether they're godly or ungodly. It doesn't matter. Everybody, no matter what they're going after, good, bad, ugly, whatever, they think this way. If they're going after it, it's because they think, I can. Amen? Yeah. If an enemy, look, Antifa, for example, they're doing what they're doing because they think, I can. Amen? Amen? Yeah. They're positively thinking about perpetrating their evil. That's the way Satan works. Yeah. I can. I can. 
Now the phrase, I can do, that's positive action now. That's positive action. Just write that in there. The phrase, I can do, it's positive action. This is where positive thinkers begin to act on what they committed to, whether it's good or bad. They act on it. And then the phrase, I can do all things. This is positive power. I can do all things. It's a positive attitude toward the power to do it. This is what, where the positive thinker begins to look for the power needed to do whatever it is that they're committed to do, good or bad. But now look, here's what separates the Christian from every other positive thinker in the world. Here's what really separates the Christian. It's the phrase, I can do all things through Christ. This is positive faith. Amen. This is positive faith. I can do all things through Christ. A positive faith is the edge that you and I need in order to be victorious over the giants that we face who are just as committed to our destruction as we are to theirs. Yep. And I'm going to add one more thing. I'm going to add. We're in a day and an age right now where nobody wants to say this, nobody wants to hear this, especially if you're Christian or claim to be Christian and all that kind of stuff. Nobody wants to hear the reality of the fact that the only way to defeat certain enemies is to destroy those enemies. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a good Christian wouldn't say that. You better study the Bible. Sometimes the only way to defeat the enemy is to destroy the enemy. Yeah. By the way, that's what we have an army for. Yeah. That's the whole point of military. Amen? Yeah. To utterly defeat the enemy. And there are going to be some giants in your life. The only way you're going to be able to... You have to be as committed to their destruction as they are to yours. Because if you aren't, they'll defeat you. Amen? Amen. They'll overpower you and they'll overcome you and you'll be left in the dust. And they'll march right on past you. And won't give you a second thought. I mean, that's what has to happen. Now... Go ahead, in the name of Jesus Christ, you exercise your commitment and you go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your giant with the purpose of defeating that giant. Amen? Of putting that giant down to the ground forever. Amen? Whatever that giant may be. And that brings us to our fifth stone, and that's this. Number five, engage your challenge. Engage your challenge. Engage your challenge. Now, I know you might be thinking, well, Pastor, you sound pretty militant this morning. Yeah, it's David and I'm sorry. Folks, whether you like it or not, we are in a militant age again. And things are militant in America. Whether we like to admit it or look at it or not, it is militant. That's why God is bringing changes to his people. That's why God is doing what he's doing to his people. That's why so many people are fleeing so many states and heading for states like Texas and, and Tennessee and Oklahoma and places like that. Tons of Christians are leaving now. Um, I, I talked to more pastors in Phoenix who are leaving. Past weekend, and uh, they're, they're heading to Texas. It, it, it's just a, it's an amazing phenomenon that's happened. And it's happened, but there's a reason for it. It's a purpose for it. You have to do it so. The, the giants are going to have to be faced. And there's going to have to be an army. There's going to have to be strength to do it. And God's building their army. Anyway, Amen. go ahead and in the name of Jesus Christ, you go toe to toe with the giant. Amen? Amen. Or whatever that giant may be. Number five, engage your challenge. This is, this is the stone. You need the fifth stone. This is the final one. It's the stone of challenge. Engage your challenge. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 48. And here's what it says. It says, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistines. Read that out loud with him. Let's read it together. Here we go. David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistines. At some moments in your life, you have to do now rather than just think. You do rather than just speak. You've spoken without what's required is doing. Amen. At some point, you've got to engage in challenge. And, and yet, verse 52 of 1 Samuel, it may be one of the most important verses of all, because David engaged Goliath on the battlefield, and David killed Goliath with Goliath's own sword. And look at what the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 52. It says, And the men of Israel and of Jacob, or of Judah, the men of Israel and of Judah arose, and they shouted, and they pursued the Philistines. Remember what we said? Here's the army of Israel on this side. They're looking down there at David going, oh, man, maybe we got a chance, right? And they're being critical of David. He's just a run. He's a little kid. What's he going to do with a slingshot? Give me a break. 
They were cheering him. They were, they were, they were just cheering him. They were cheering him. But now all of a sudden, things have changed. Amen? Amen. Most of the great successes that people have in life happen because that person saw somebody else do the impossible. We, we see somebody else do it, and now we go, if they can do it, I can do it. Amen? Amen. See, David dealt with a giant, and an army got up. That's right. David defeated a giant, and an army shouted. David gained victory over his enemy, and an army pursued theirs. Amen. See, when you engage your challenge, when you stand victorious over whatever giant it is you're facing, you're going to have an impact on a lot of other people. Amen? Amen. You're going to have an impact. You might recall a fellow by the name of Roger Bannister. If you don't know who Roger Bannister is, his, his cause in life was to break the four-minute mile in running. That was his cause. That was his purpose. People said that it could never be done. Nobody could run a mile in four minutes or less. Nobody could do it. And it had never been done. Doctors at the time were saying that the human body could not stand the strain that it would take to do that. And yet that was Roger Bannister's purpose. That was his cause. That was his giant. And so Roger Bannister charted a course of how he was going to get the job done. He was willing to pay whatever cost was involved. And he just went ahead and he exercised his commitment. And he did that. And he engaged the challenge. And he worked at it and worked at it. And Roger Bannister broke the four-minute mile. And as a result of that today, there have been hundreds of others who have broken the four-minute mile. Hundreds of others of people who have done it. See, I just wonder what the kingdom of God is waiting on before we recognize, I mean, really recognize what Romans 8.37 says. Look at that verse. It says, but in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. Amen. We're already more than conquerors. Amen? Amen. we just got to recognize it. We've got to see it. See, maybe you're sitting here today and your giant is a situation at work or maybe it's a situation at home and maybe your giant is so big that you're saying to yourself, there's just no way. There's no way I can overcome this thing. But I wonder what would happen if you engage the challenge and Jesus Christ gave you the victory over that giant. I just wonder, who else behind you would say, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. I wonder what young person in your life would see you do that. They would see you defeat your giant and they would say, my dad can do that. If my mom can do that, I can do it too. I can do it too. they can do it, I can do it. If she can do it, I can do it. If he can do it, I can do it. If the church can do it, I can do it. He made it there, I can do it. See, when Israel saw the victory of David, they, they arose and they shouted, they pursued the enemy. Now that sounds a lot like what Jesus has done for us, doesn't it? I mean, all of mankind was cowering in the trenches while Satan stood up taunting the children of God placing fear in our hearts and causing us to live in terrible bondage to sin. But one man stepped forward. One man broke history in two. One man stepped forward and took on the challenge and engaged Satan personally. And the battle lasted for three days. And at first it had appeared that Satan had won the battle. But on the third day, Jesus came out of the grave alive, defeating the unholy trinity, which consists of death and the grave and of Satan himself. And they were all defeated by Jesus Christ. On that third day, Jesus became the example then of the victory that every single one of us can have. Not only over Satan, but over every giant that we face in our life. Because like David, we too can take our stand and say to our giants, I come to you not with a sword or with a spear or with a javelin, but I come to you in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And what Jesus started 2,000 years ago has had a mighty rippling effect that's still being felt today. Amen? But listen, the gates of hell itself shall not pre prevail against the church of the living God. Amen? They can't. See, we can pursue the enemy with confidence of victory because Jesus is our example of that victory. And maybe today is the day, maybe today, is the day that you say, it's my turn. Pastor, it's my turn. It's my turn. Today it's my turn to do what Jesus has already done. Today it's my turn to have the courage to face and to defeat that giant in my life. Today's the day. 
Today's the day to defeat giants like pornography or homosexuality or abortion or racism or addiction or whatever it is. It's time to stand up like the nation of Israel and shout for the victory of our, is ours. Jesus has shown us the way. Amen? Amen. Let the giants of pornography come down in your life. Let the giants of addiction come down. Let the giants of immorality come down. Let the giants of apathy and complacency come down in your life. Let the giants of self-centeredness come down in your life. Let the giants of selfishness come down in your life. It's time these giants came down. It's time to declare victory and then to live in that victory. Because thanks be to Jesus Christ, the victory now is ours. Amen. I heard an old, old story. How a Savior came from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. And some sweet day I'm going to sing up there the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. Amen? Amen. Take your giant down in the victory of Jesus Christ. Do it. Don't wait. Time is short. Time is not on our side in that sense. God has given us a limited amount of time to do what needs to be done. Today, the Bible says, is the day of salvation. Amen? Amen. You know what that means? Redeem the time. Amen? Amen? Take advantage of the time you have. Today's the day that giant needs to start coming down. Amen. So would you stand with me and let's pray? I want to ask you to close your eyes and bow your heads for just a moment. And with your heads down and eyes closed, just listen for just a second. Let me ask you. In fact, maybe you were to say to me, just from your heart right now, maybe you're saying, Pastor Doug, I'm dealing with some giant in my life right now, and here's what it is. In your mind, just name it. Whatever it is, just, just name it. And now would you just confess that giant to God? Just admit it to God that it's a giant in your life. Just tell God. It's a, it's a giant God that needs to come down. I want you to know that you can rock that giant today, but you need to begin to use the stones of purpose and cause. You need to have that cause, that purpose in your life. It needs to be established and set. Look at the cost. Yeah, there's going to be a price tag. It's probably going to be some criticism. There's going to be loneliness. Of it. Maybe just you doing it, but you've got to do it. You've seen the giant now. Establish your course. Say, I'm moving in that direction now. I'm going to do this. Exercise your commitment. Make that Make that. Verbal commitment. Say, I'm going to do this. Tell somebody. Talk about it. Just make that verbal commitment. And at some point, engage that challenge. Engage, engage the enemy. Engage that giant. And bring him down in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray for every person here. I pray, God, that you just give them everything they need. All the stones they need this morning, Father, to bring down the giant in their life. David only needed one. We may need all five. But, Father, they're there for a purpose. They're there for a reason. Lord, help us to use them to your glory and honor. Help us to bring down these giants, whatever that giant may be. I pray this in the powerful and holy name of Jesus Christ, who is our victor, who is our salvation, who has shown us the way how to have this kind of victory. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. 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 Let's continue to sing together.